Technology's fine, but the devil's in the deployment. Hello, I'm Philip Hound Baker, and in this presentation, I want to take a look at what I believe is the very hardest part of the mesh, which is how do we deploy it? The internet is a very, very large system. It has 5 billion users. It has 50 billion hosts. Changing a machine with 50 billion moving parts and 5 billion uh, people providing requirements is going to be hard. There's a lot of inertia there. And so we have to think about deployment. Now, this is the same problem we faced at CERN when we were building the web. The web had a deployment strategy. That is what distinguished the web from competing network hypertech systems. The web was designed for deployment. So having explained the why in the first podcast, and I'll be coming to the what in the next podcast, and then following that, the how, the first thing we have to address is the who. Who needs to be involved and what is their incentive? How do we get to critical mass? Well, let's take the easy part off the table first of all. The mesh is open. The specifications are open. The reference code is open. The designs are open. The services are open. I'm not aware of there being any patent encumbrances. Obviously, I can't guarantee that. You know, I, I work as a expert witness in patent uh, cases and, you know, nobody can ever give you a full guarantee. But I'm aware of prior art for the underlying cryptography and for many of the applications of that cryptography uh, going back 20 years uh, or at least 10. And in many cases, it's stuff that I've developed myself. Um, the reference code is open source. It's released on an MIT license, the most permissive possible. I'll come back to that in uh, shortly. And the architecture supports open services. This isn't one of those open protocols where it turns out that, well, the specification and the code are open, but you're only actually going to be able to connect to the other users if you take it from the one service provider that the code base recognizes. And if you try and retarget for any other service provider, well, you've got no audience. And so, you know, we're not playing that game. Mesh users will be able to set up their own service provider. There'll be no um, constraints on who can communicate with who. Completely open. And people can, uh, when people generate their Mesh accounts, the accounts will belong to them. You know, not like traditional internet mail where, you know, the account really belongs to the service provider because that's where the point of contact is and Alice can't really change that. Oh, no, we're not going to play that game either. Open means open. So the user has to be able to switch their service provider at will. So open means open. That applies to making it possible for other companies to build on top of the mesh. Now, in the last um, presentation, I uh, mentioned a password vault, you know, using the credentials catalog of the mesh to store passwords. And some of the people who reviewed that video came back to me and said, well, you know, you tried to replace LastPass. And they said, no, no, that's not the point. You know, I'm trying to establish an open standard here that LastPass should consider as a business opportunity. Right now, they use a technology standard called uh, PBKDF2. It's a password-based key derivation. Um, it does an okay job. But the threshold cryptography, the meta cryptography used in the mesh is more powerful. And LastPass can adopt my technology and use it to provide their service to their users. They can even, you know, 
make it proprietary so that they can't switch out of LastPass Universe if they choose. However, think about this. The reason that LastPass is so popular right now is that the use of password managers is becoming inescapable. You know, users have hundreds of passwords and right now the only way that they can manage them is to use the same password at every service and obviously that has a security problem and the shortest password that is secure is twice as long as the one that the longest one that can be memorized yeah the use of the emergence of an open standards based password manager that is built into every browser so that users can generate really strong 16, 20, 24 character passwords and use them across all their devices. You know, that, that's pretty much inevitable in five or ten years time. If not the mesh, then something is going to commoditize that space because it simply has to happen because there's just too much pain there. So if you try and keep with the proprietary model, you know, you're doomed to uh, extinction anyway. However, if you adopt, if you embrace the mesh, what I can provide you with is a entry map to the next web. You can provide your users who are currently only using you for a password vault, they can be using you to manage their entire digital gestalt. You provide your users with more value, you continue to exist. And so what I'm offering here is to establish a way of moving from the existing product, which is limited to one application, to the new digital world where you can provide deep security and be the user's um, help for security generally. So there are business opportunities here, not just business threats. There is a carrot and there is a stick. The technology platform, you know, also fairly straightforward. You know, I just used modern standards wherever they exist. So I've used the modern state of the art of cryptography uh, and wherever it takes, there's a choice, I've always used the strongest form. So AES encryption, always at 256 bits. SHA-2 and SHA-3 digest, always at the full 512 bit strength. The CFRG elliptic curves, um, there's a bit more variation there, but I won't get into the reasons why. Um, every new feature that we've added has been engineered in such a way that it could be reused in legacy applications. So, you know, you could take the mesh um, group encryption, the threshold encryption scheme, and apply it back to S-Mine if you chose. I'm not sure that that would make a lot of sense because I think that, you know, Greenfield, you know, if you're not going to be backwards compatible, why bother? But you can if you want. And I've used JSON encoding throughout uh, and the Jose signature encryption scheme. Uh, the one small tweak that I made there was uh, straight JSON has a, an efficiency issue because each time you encode binary data, it increases in size by 33%. That's not scalable. So particularly if you want to be able to encode video streams, and so a very simple extension to the uh, JSON scheme that's backwards compatible allows us to do binary data. And we facilitate the use of the mesh to configure existing protocols. So we, you can uh, use the mesh to configure your SSH, your OpenPGP, your SMIME. Uh, I'm talking to the developers of some applications uh, about uh, making it easier to integrate there and it can also be used as a platform to build completely new applications. So, so the technology platform is open 
and it can be used within the mesh or it can be used as the string broad to build you know, the next leg's greatest thing. Okay, so those are the easy parts. Now let's get on to the hard part. How do we build an early adopter community? And the part that is hard here is that until you get to critical mass, what people talk about as viral marketing, what they talk about as the network effect, is really the chicken and the egg problem. So we have uh, an application. And you know, it, it, if it succeeds like the web does, well, it goes from zero and it climbs, and because the value proposition for the application increases with the size of the network, the number of users increases, we get positive feedback, and then if this is 0% of the population, and this is 100%, it can take off and it can basically saturate in a very short time. With the web, uh, this position here was about 1993, the start of 1993, and this position here would be 1994, January. Um, and it, the, the web went from almost nobody using it to 100% of people who were using the internet were using the web uh, by about 1994. And of course, you know, the web continued to grow after that, of course, but after that, the web was growing because the internet was also growing. So this part is of the curve is really great. You know, at this point on, you've got to critical mass, fine. The hard part is how do we get to critical mass and we have so with the mesh I've got th a three phase strategy uh, phase one two and three so phase one before you've got you know when I started using the web we had 100 users not 100,000 100 and so you know the web wasn't really any use as a publication tool. The only thing that you could use it for would be for your own personal uh, storage or to uh, obtain the small amount of information that other people had put up. Uh, it, it really wasn't a very useful system. Uh, at CERN itself, the killer application was you could go to the web and the CERN phone book was on it. And in those days, you know, the phone was how most people communicated because you know, most people only read their email once a day or maybe even once a week. So if you wanted to have coffee with somebody, you had to phone them, not email them. So phase one, you've got to look for applications that deliver value to a user without there being any other people using it. So things that come in here are SSH. Uh, configuring SSH keys was suggested by uh, Dave Clark. Um, uh, configuring your OpenPGP, configuring your S-Mine. Uh, those are things that are really valuable, even if nobody else is using the mesh. Um, a pa the password vault, that's another example of a facility that is useful to a system administrator even if nobody else is using it, and even before it's supported in the browser. Why is that? Well, if you look on GitHub, uh, one of the biggest ways that passwords leak from organizations is that system administrators put passwords into a shell script and then upload that script to GitHub, where it becomes public. And there are people who scrape GitHub continuously looking for people who have uploaded scripts that have passwords in. And if you 
you know, I've done a few tests and it appears that the mean time between uploading a script with a password to somebody attempting to use that password is about six hours. So that's a real way that they leak and the, the mesh password vault can uh, avoid that hole. You know, you've got a way of avoiding uh, putting this, the password in the script because you can put a, a line that says pull the data out of the uh, mesh uh, and so that line goes into the script instead of the password itself and so you get a bit more security. Yeah. All security failures are obvious after the fact. The real trick is realizing before you get bitten. Okay, so we start off and we have users at an enterprise who are using the mesh. So users at different enterprises and they're using the mesh. And maybe we have an enterprise where, you know, one sys administrator, you know, sells it to a whole bunch of their other system administrator friends. And then they start to think, well, we want to be able to roll out PGP and S or SMIME or whatever to all our employees. We want to make use of that data at rest encryption scheme for all our employees or the most important ones. Uh, we want to use the secure mesh based internet communications. So we deploy the mesh within our enterprise. So, and this is something that actually happens today. I mean, like people say, well, you're not going to replace SMTP. And I ask them, well, what mail messaging system do you use inside your company? And they say, well, SMTP, of course. And then I'll ask them, are you sure? Are you sure it's not Exchange? Yeah. Most organizations use a different messaging platform internally to externally. You know, they may not advertise the fact, but uh, when you start to look at the protocols that are actually being used, it's uh, quite common. And so if we can get a number of enterprises who are using the mesh for their internal communications, that gives gets us further up the curve and at some point we get to the point where one of these organizations looks out the window and it says oh what are our most sensitive what are our most secret documents are those documents that stay inside the company or do we share them with people outside and when you start to think about it, what are the most secret documents? Well, you have your research and development, perhaps. Well, isn't that something that's going to end up going to the external patent council? You have your accounts. Well, aren't those going to go to the auditors? You have your sales data. Well, don't you sell to people outside the company? Don't you buy from people? outside the company. And so when you start to think about it, most of the most secret stuff, the most confidential stuff, tends to be across organizational boundaries. And in particular, if you're a law firm or an accountancy firm or whatever, client confidentiality, that's your biggest concern. And so you want to take your end-to-end -end secure messaging from being an intranet application to extranet, as soon as your partners and your suppliers are saying, oh yes, we now have the mesh internally, uh, why don't we just join up the systems? Why don't we get joined up security? And that's how I believe we can hit the critical mass point where at this point, RFPs start to be going out uh, that to say for uh, enterprise communication system saying do you support mesh configuration?
do you support mesh integration? And once those RFPs hit, at that point, the technology providers have to support the mesh and the tipping point is reached. And so there is a real chance if we can get over this initial hump, you know, if we can get through phase one, we can go to phase two and then we've got a good chance of the network effect taking over and instead of it being the chicken and the egg problem that is harming us, it becomes the viral marketing that causes us to succeed. So what's the current status? Well, the specifications, they're very nearly complete. Um, they're not final, they're nearly complete. What's the difference? Well, complete means that you can read the specifications and you can implement a working system from them. Final means that we've got an actual standards based system and other people have agreed that that's the way to do it. And so when I propose a specification, I always try to get it to the point where it is final. Sorry, it is, I always try to get to the point where it is complete. But of course, it's never final because the final piece is what the standards process is all about. And, you know, we can't have a system that's going to take over the world if there's only one person's ideas of what types of security are necessary. That system was presented at the Montreal ITF earlier this year and there's a proposal to have a working group forming Birds of a Feather BOF session in this November in Singapore. So the more people that I get saying that they're interested in this stuff, the greater my claim on the time and resources to have a standards group form. So this is a call out to the internet developer community. I need your help. I'm not going to be able to secure the internet all by myself. I need you to help by writing code, writing specifications, reviewing specifications, helping on the website, using the applications as they become available, telling me what's wrong with them, telling me how to, they can be improved. And yeah, we've got a problem here you know, the internet is insecure. You know, that whole new world that Tim Berners-Lee talked about 25 years ago at the first web conference, we have real problems. We have to fix them. Please help me. You can help. And even if you can't be part of the MeSH project itself, well, you can help by saying that this is something that you're interested in and would like to see happen. And you can do that by liking this video and subscribing to this channel and there'll be more videos to come. Now the ones to come uh, however are going to get a bit more technical because so far we've been looking at the requirements and the deployment strategy. The next piece I want to start looking at is the actual technology and so for those of you who are interested in technology and how it works I think that that's going to be very interesting to you. So please like my channel, please subscribe, and thank you very much for watching. Thank you.